Well, good morning, everybody. I hope it's uh, a warm day, a warmer day than it is here in uh, Frigid St. Louis. But uh, my name is Bart Hamilton. I'm the research director for the Koch Center for Family Business. And on behalf of all of us at the Koch Center for Family Business, I'd like you to I'd like to welcome you to uh, the second session of our sixth annual symposium on family business. We're obviously would love to be doing this in person, but we cannot. And so this year, our format has been uh, two hour sessions each week in February. So February is the Koch Center Family Business Month. Um, this year, our uh, symposium's uh, topic is the importance of culture in family business. Um, and I'd like to thank the Koch family for supporting us and putting on this family business as you, uh, symposium. As you know, the the goal of the Koch Center for Family Business is to support and sustain family businesses both in the region, nationwide, and globally through teaching, research, and engagement. Um, and this is part of that. Last week, uh, in our first session, we had the CEO of Tata Consulting Services, Subramani and Ramadurai, who talked about the unique culture at the Tata Group, one of the largest family uh, businesses in the world and how that culture and how their business interacted, the growth of Tata Consulting Services uh, kind of interacted with the growth and success of India. Um, today, we're going to hear from a fifth generation member of uh, a family business. that's one of the most iconic uh, brands in the world. It's a brand you all have heard of, Bacardi. Um, and we'll hear how kind of how the family culture and environment has influenced just the amazing success and growth of Bacardi. And we'll be hearing from Lisanne Dorian, who's, who's uh, on the board of directors uh, there for Bacardi. Um, just so you know, the format of the session today is we'll have a one hour uh, moderated panel discussion with our, our distinguished speaker. And then we'll have in the second hour, we'll have a panel discussion with panelists uh, reflecting on what they learned from the first hour. And um, the second hour panel is gonna be moderated by Gina Hoagland, who's the chairman and principal of Collaborative Strategies. The first hour though, I'd like to introduce my colleague and friend, Spencer Burke, the Eugene F. Williams executive in residence uh, at the Koch Center, who will be moderating, uh, leading the conversation with Lee Zan. Um, and Spencer, I'll turn it over to you. Really looking forward to the next hour today. Well, thank you, Bart, and uh, welcome everybody to our second installment of the importance of culture and family business. And boy, do we have a great uh, presenter today. The focus will be on, on Bacardi Limited based in Bermuda um, and its culture, uh, both from the family perspective as well as from the, from the business side. For those of you who are not aware, Bacardi is the largest privately owned spirits company in the world. It's the 286th largest family business in the world based on revenues. Um, and an exciting fact is it's, uh, as of Friday, I believe it is, it, 159 years old. So born in 1862 and not only alive and well today, but absolutely thriving. We will have uh, two great presenters for Bacardi today, sort of uh, an outside person and an inside person. We have. Lisanne Dorian. Lisanne is a fifth generation uh, Bacardi family member and a member of its board of directors. And we will also have Scott Northcutt, who is the uh, senior vice president of Bacardi and uh, responsible for um, human, human resources there. So a few words about each of them, and then I'll turn the program over to Lisanne and Scott. Um, among Lisanne's responsibilities on the board at Bacardi, is as board sponsor of the Bacardi Family Development Program. Uh, Lisanne is a graduate of Williams College, uh, has a law degree from American University in, in Washington, DC, and uh, has her executive MBA from the Darden School. She practiced international licensing and environmental law and was with Bacardi in that capacity for eight years. Uh, Lizanne currently is a faculty advisor to the Tuck Business School's Global Consultancies on-site program where she travels with students when we don't have a COVID pa pandemic around the world to the leading companies in the world. Um, I always like to pick out a few fun facts about our speakers so it makes them human on this Zoom call. And 
with Lizanne, that was not difficult, uh, not just one fun fact, but several um, of many that she has. First of all, she's a helicopter pilot, if you can believe that. She is a world competitive equestrian in the sport of endurance racing and has done that all over the world, including before the Queen of England. And this is the best. Uh, this is sort of hard to believe. She was the 2006 winner of the Four Deserts World Championship, which, if I understand it right, is a foot race across the four largest deserts in the world, and she won. So we have a world champion in our midst. Welcome, Lizanne. And then I have Scott. Uh, Scott is, he has a, just a minor job at Bacardi as Senior Vice President for Human Resources. He has the responsibility of making every primo successful. Now you'll, you'll say, what in the world is a primo? Well, Scott and Lizanne will talk about that in a second. Prior to Bacardi, Scott worked with some of the lead, world's leading companies, including Walmart, DHL Limited, and Dollar General. Uh, he will join in the conversation after uh, Lizanne's presentation, talking about um, uh, the family side of, of Bacardi and her role on the board. Um, it wasn't difficult to find a fun fact about Scott as well, and that is his favorite drink is the Rum Rider. Bacardi ate with a slice of orange on the rocks. How about that? Now, let's get on with our program and hear the Bacardi story and the origins of its remarkable culture from Lizanne. Lizanne, take it away. Oh, thank you so much, Spencer. And uh, Bart as well, the entire Koch Center and the, the Olin Business School. And everyone attending virtually, it's a, a real pleasure. I'm delighted and humbled to actually spend time today sharing with you all the brilliance of understanding and using culture in a family business. And now, now culture is many things. Um, it's not static, I can tell you that, and it certainly must be nurtured. So my goal for today is to share with you the Bacardi story and how deliberate and thoughtful actions reveal the competitive advantage of culture. And Dave, if you could sort of switch us over to um, the, the slide presentation now, that'd be fabulous. Typically when we share insights about Bacardi, we have a stunning beverage to bring our passion to life Unfortunately, due to COVID, that's not possible today. So what we're gonna do is pivot and we're not gonna share with you a video that helps you understand our passion and our history. In 1862, our journey began in Santiago de Cuba. Don Facundo Bacardi Masso had a vision to create the world's first light-bodied rum. His process was revolutionary. Isolate a specific strain of yeast. Select high quality molasses. Distill and filter multiple times. And age in charred oak casks. The rest is a Bacardi family secret. Don Facundo's wife, Doña Amalia, stamped the rum with the iconic bat. The idea came when she spotted fruit bats hanging in the distillery. Symbolizing good health, good fortune, and family unity, the rum of the bat was born. Over the years, new cocktails became fan favorites. The Bacardi Cuba Libre, the original Bacardi Daiquiri, and the authentic Bacardi Mojito helped the brand flourish. Political instability, earthquakes, prohibition, and even illegal confiscation of company assets in Cuba didn't stop the family. Bacardi became Cuba's first multinational company. And more than 100 years after its founding, Bacardi established a new home base on another island, Bermuda. Today, we are the largest privately held spirits company in the world and sell in more than 160 markets. We take pride in our portfolio that includes Bacardi rum, martini vermouths and sparkling wines, Grey Goose Vodka, Dewar's Blended Scotch Whiskey, Bombay Sapphire Gin, Patron Ultra Premium Tequila, and more than 200 brands and labels. We continue to be part of the solution for responsible sourcing, producing, packaging, operational efficiencies, and marketing of our products. 
These commitments to do the right thing are part of who we are, along with our values, trust, passion, caring, and excellence. After more than 150 years, our journey continues being fearless as a family and with a founder's mentality. Salute to the Bacardi family, company, and brand. Wow, I mean, every time I see that video, I notice a new element of what this family and business has overcome and actually brought to the world. And I hope that you guys are excited to see how this history translates into the business today. Now, speaking of today, what does our family look like? You can see a picture in front of you that was taken um, at the 150th celebration approximately 10 years ago. But we're actually 1,000 family members strong. We have 425 shareholders. We're in our eighth generation. We have our seventh generation working within the company. And as um, Spencer noted, I'm a, a fifth generation, and I think I've been referred to as a young fifth generation. <laughs> now, while, while we are many, it is actually the action of individuals that reinforces the strength of our culture. So I'd like to share with you a real story of how one family member who is emblematic of many family members and non-family members. And by the way, a little segue, Spencer noticed earlier that um, he used the word primo. And what primo is for us is that in Spanish, it actually means cousin. But for us, we have family members that are blood, yes. However, through respect, work, and passion, everyone who works with Bacardi is called a primo. So you won't hear us say employees. And so as I reference primo, you know what that means. So this story I'm about to tell you, yes, it's about a family member, but it could also be about a primo. And the story begins in the top left-hand corner of your screen. And that's the famous Cathedral of Rum. It was built in 1958, almost 100, almost 100 years after the founding of Bacardi. And it was a testament to overcoming pandemics, to being kicked out of a country. And here it was, the largest dist distillery in the world. And it sits on a spit of land, as you can see right there in the middle of your screen. Now on the far right of your screen, you see a picture of a, of a gentleman and, and his wife, and that gentleman is George, and that's what this story is gonna be about. Now, George is a PhD chemist. He graduated from Yale in the late 50s. And as the 60s wore on, he realized his specialty was in chemiluminescence and anaerobic digestion, which is basically waste treatment. And in the late 60s, he actually moved himself and his family, four young children, out to California. And his new company was actually advising municipalities on how, how to handle this new act that had been implemented by the federal government called the Environmental Protection Act. And so he was out there, you know, going about his business. And as the story goes, one Sunday, he was having lunch with his family and he received a call from a New York lawyer. Now, as we all know, it's probably not a good thing to get a call from a New York lawyer on a Sunday. And what this lawyer said is he said, George, your family needs you. And George said, I looked around and my wife and my four children were right there. He said, I don't understand. And at this point, the lawyer said, Jorge, la familia. And for those of you who don't know Spanish, um, George was just called with his Spanish name and la familia means family. And what this lawyer said was your family needs you, your greater family needs you. And in fact, the lawyer went on to say that we don't know how to speak to these EPA people and we need your help. They are coming after our lifeblood. They're coming after the cathedral. So George flew out to Puerto Rico to assess the situation. And lo and behold, he ended up having to transplant his family to Puerto Rico to address the problems with these new government regulations. Now, what was so unique and why this really reveals a lot about the Bacardi family and its culture is that the EPA had no solutions for how to remediate and address these problems. The industry had no solutions on how to handle this problem. And in fact, no technology at the time existed to help remediate these problems. And what transpired in the next few years was that George built a team 
And with a lot of tenacity and hard work, he realized and the team realized that it was their responsibility to the family and to the business to come up with a solution for our Cathedral of Rome. So it is a common passion and a common purpose that drove this endeavor. And in fact, what happened was that not only did they meet the EPA guidelines and come up with a solution, but they became the single leader within the industry for how, how to manage waste and also how to look at environmental stewardship. And if we can all think back to the late 70s, that was quite a feat. But what it did is it showed the Bacardi family and what it does is to do the right thing, do it well and come up with solutions. And that has now been a cornerstone, not just in this facility, which is 100% sustainable, but in all of our facilities around the world. And to really to, to bring this forward, and this is just, it's a, it's a great sort of, again, affirmation of how this family and culture works together. I got um, a news release the other day, and this is what's so cool. We live environmental, we live sustainability. And in fact, we just announced that we're launching the first 100% biodegradable bottle, which will replace 80 million plastic bottles and eliminate 3,000 tons of plastic. Now, if that isn't sort of living your culture, uh, I'm not sure what is. And what's really neat, and to bring it home for everyone who's wondering about what happened to George, George actually went on and, and he worked for a long time. He retired in the mid 90s and he mentored many people. And in fact, one of the individuals he mentored was the leader of the team that came up with this biodegradable bottle, who incidentally is also a family member. So I think that is one story that hopefully shows you that in, in our company, we've been able to have individuals who understand and are committed to not just the culture and doing the right thing, but also the greater business and family as a whole. So in this situation, you can see how Bacardi allows culture to fuel the success. And I can tell you that anyone who's on this call, you can do the same with your culture. So let's move on and see how from these historical stories, we can sort of come to today. And what I'd really like to do is leave you with two um, really concrete examples. And of course, Scott's gonna help me out with this on how Bacardi has been able to bring culture and strategy together. I mean, think about it. How in the world did we go from the, the picture on the top of the screen, which was shot in 1898, as our company was, or as our family was doing the right thing, and they were fighting for independence. And in this situation, they're about to be sent off as prisoners of war, by the way. And they were young entrepreneurs. How do we take that from 1898 and bring it to today? Where, as you can see on this screen on the left hand side, the flags represent where we've been voted the best places to work in those countries. And then on the right, you can see that I believe it's seven or more years where we have been voted the most rep, one of the most reputable companies in the world. You know, how do we get to 2020 and doing the right thing? So, like I said, Scott will fill us in a little bit later, but I just want to highlight two programs that I think have really been the key to bringing culture into our business and ultimately into our strategy. The first program I want to talk about centers on developing and investing in our primos. And this is called the Emilio Bacardi program. And we've done it in, con in conjunction with HBS. And what it consists of is it's a multi-year program. And it takes our primos, usually about 30 to 40 in each cohort. We're on our third cohort. And what it does is it dedicates programs with HBS to developing not just the organizational skill sets and understanding what is going on from a business perspective, but allowing and investing in the individuals themselves so that they can be the best version to propel Bacardi forward. And it's just been a fascinating program, which I've been able to be part of in, in a small way. But Scott, again, he'll give you the real insights on this. Now, again, I want to show you how this translates, this program actually translates into allowing our business to thrive because we're not just about words, we wanna see results. And so 
We had a new CEO who came on board about 36 months ago or so. Now, when I say new, that's a bit of a misnomer because he had actually been within the company for over 20 years. And his name is Mahesh. And Mahesh is a fabulous individual. And when he came in, of course, he was going to develop his new strategic plan as part of his, his remit. And so rather than grabbing a C-suite of people and going and hanging out with a consulting firm, what Mahesh does is he tapped into the Emilio program and the individuals there. And in fact, over 100 primos contributed to our CEO developing his strategic plan, which is just amazing if you think about it. And what I'm about to show you in the next two slides are the actual strategic plan that, that has been prevented, prevented, uh, presented around the world. Now, as you see this purpose, great, celebrating moments that matter one drink at a time, spot on. The vision to be the world's leading premium spirits house, love for iconic brands that bring people together for exceptional drinks experiences. Ah, wonderful. But I tell you what, what I take away is what all of this is resting on. And I hope everyone watching this sees that Fearless Founders and Family is exactly what the video was showing you, is exactly what the story I shared with you exemplified. It's our culture. It's how we do things. And to think that our primos and our CEO believe that this was the foundation of making our best 10 strategy work. Now, if that's not really a validation of how important culture can be. Um, I'd be hard pressed to find what is. So what really emerged today is that the company itself has been able to, not just through individuals, but as a momentum amongst primos and family members to allow our culture to fuel our success. And as we turn to really what this fearless founders and family means, just take a moment and, and read at the, at the bottom of the slide, because these are the words that our primos came up with to describe this family business. It was, it was not told to them through the board or through family members. This is actually what goes through our business every single day when a primo comes into work. So can we use our culture as a strategic advantage, as a competitive advantage? I absolutely say yes. And the reason is not just because they put these words there, but because it's actually come to life, whether it's in, in dealing with COVID. We have outperformed our competitive set in many regions around the world because of our fearless founders and family mentality. We, it's proven true in our product innovation with our biodegradable bottles, with leading in, in low alcohol beverages and innovating. I mean, that is really what is so cool. We have the proof in the pudding, as it were. So can culture power a winning strategy? Um, the Bacardi answer is yes. And don't just take it from me. You can always ask one of our primos because, again, I'm just representing what this company is all about. And speaking of what this company is all about, and as Spencer alluded to earlier, you know, we are, we are a family company. Yes, we're in our eighth generation. And what I wanna leave you with now is the second uh, sort of concrete program that we put together to ensure that culture remains vibrant, but it also remains a positive force within our company. And so as you'll see here on the top left-hand uh, slot, um, it's actually, if you look at the back row, you'll see a little bit more gray hair and more mature individuals. And then as, <laughs> as we move forward, they're a little bit younger. This picture was snapped about two years ago at our family development program. At that time, I believe we were in our sixth year of the program. And what the family development program is, is that we brought together, we partnered with HBS and the, the Cambridge group. And we've come together with this, with this purpose. And the, and the purpose is to be able to develop knowledgeable and thoughtful family members to pursue whatever their passion is. However, to always be cognizant of their responsibility and stewardship that they have towards our family business. Now, what this program consists of is we meet once a year for a long weekend. We have case studies that we review. 
We have executives that come in within the company. So we're talking about free cash flow. Oh gosh, you know, we're gonna have our, one of our finance guys come in. And so we bring together Primos with the case studies and that is from the business side. We also spend a lot of time developing the individual. And as the individual, you know, because they need to be leaders no matter where they go in this world. That, that's our sense and our responsibility we have as a family. And it's really interesting because not just are these people because, oh, we think they might work in the company. That is not at all the reason. What we want to do is create knowledgeable and responsible family members, wherever they may end up. And I can tell you, they end up in a lot of places. We have, uh, we have a nurse, we have an astrophysicist, we have individuals in the arts, we have individuals in the sciences. So this is, this is definitely to develop the individual for the longevity of our company and our culture. And so with that, I have to say, you know, can culture be a competitive advantage? Absolutely. Must you lead by example? Must you take definitive steps that are purposeful and concrete to build the best of your culture? For sure. And so at this point, it's only fair that I'd like to thank each of you. Um, and now I know we're gonna move on to another segment, but most importantly, I wanna thank all the primos at Bacardi because quite frankly, it's all of them together with the family that makes my job a privilege and a, and a pleasure. So with that, um, Spencer, I wanna thank you and, and I'll hand it back over to you. Well, Lizanne, that was great. I think a lot of people are just, um, I mean, overwhelmed by the idea of a thousand family members, but I, I wanna sort of dwell on that for a second because you, and then we'll get over to Scott. Um, you made the comment talking about George, uh, who, does he have any relationship to you, by the way? Well, interestingly enough, no one in our family takes calls from lawyers anymore because yes, George, in fact, was, uh, my father oh my and God. almost 20 years later, I had a call from Bacardi saying, ah, we need some legal help in Europe. And so, um, in my family, you're, you're, oh, that's you're, great. you're you be very careful. Yeah. So that, that was in fact, my father. Thank you. That is great. What a, what a great story, but the, I, it help us understand this, this, this bigger, uh, definition of, of family in, in the United States. Of course, we, we, we think nuclear family, which is parents and their offspring and that's sort of it. But where does that come from? Is that, is that a, a Spanish thing? I know the the Bacardi family came from Catalonia and Spain and then in Cuba, but it, I think it's a different, sort of just a different sense of how you relate to one another. I mean, is that something, and have you lost that given the passage of time and more people growing up in the United States, such as yourself? Right, great, a uh, terrific question. I think that actually the, the foundation of, of family or la familia certainly comes out of our Spanish heritage. And also, you know, when you come into to Cuba and um, that is something because back in the 1850s, you would leave your home country and come to Cuba. And that that actually helped create more of a family sense with the individuals that were with you. And I think you also became more comfortable realizing that someone might not be family by blood, but they were just just as much a family as if they were. And I think that that's very important. And I would also say that um, it's, it's certainly stayed with each one of us, even though we are now all over the world and we don't look like each other anymore and all speak the same language. We still have that very deep, and I would say the best of what a family can be. Um, and that, that is where we are today, for sure. I mean, I, can, I just found out that I have a family member that is um, at the, the university um, veterinary. She's, a, she's top veterinarian up there. And I just found that out, you know, last year. And you can call her up on the phone. I mean, it's just, yes, we're family. There, there's a that connection. Is, that is fantastic. Now, Scott, uh, I'd love to have you talk about your program. And uh, the, as it relates to the thousand people, do they all have like a green card so they can all come and show up and work at Bacardi? How, you're head of HR. How does that work? Well, thank you, Spencer. And uh, thank you, Liz. On, and What's great about this initiative is this program today is we'll be sharing it with our primos throughout the world as well. So it's going to serve many purposes for us. And in regard to people working uh, for us, you know, we have the Emilio Bacardi program, which is our internal program we do with HBS for development. And we bring our top leaders together. And as Lizanne said, we're into our third cohort now. 
And then we do the family development program. But with the family development program, as she highlighted, there's an internship and, and the program we do with Harvard. On the internship, Spencer, we allow, there, it's a selection process, they have to apply, et cetera. And then we allow them to pick their uh, primary location and a secondary, and we try to get them to the primary. Then we help them with their visas, et cetera. And typically their internship will range from six to 10 weeks uh, during the summer. And once they complete that, then they're eligible for the program at Harvard. Um, and we do encourage them to try to get out of, in many cases, to get outside of their home environment uh, so that they can experience another part of the world. But also, as Lizanne said, this learning that they're getting by getting exposure to the company, to the brands, and to the primos has been fabulous for everybody. And it's really helped the company and it's helped them. So it's, it's working really well. I, I just love this concept of Primo and the idea yeah. that you're, you're all on the same team. And I guess maybe talk about if, if we asked a, a Primo what the Bacardi family culture is, um, would that be this founder concept? Is that, is that yeah, how yeah, it, yeah. It, it, it gets yeah. introduced? Yeah. And, it, and just a quick uh, story on how did we become Primos? And first of all, if you go back to the early days of Bacardi, when they were first, uh, the family was first exiled from Cuba. And you read the book, The Long Fight for Cuba, which is a fabulous story about Cuba's history. You will see how they brought um, primos over at that time called employees and, and took them into their homes, helped get them their jobs and uh, provided for them. And that's never stopped. And Interesting. It, was, it was at the HBS session uh, for Emilio Bacardi, the internal one for our primos, where the word primo was adopted. Facundo Bacardi, who is our current chairman, and really is the person who inspired getting all these initiatives together for us, uh, said to all the primos in the room that as a Bacardi family member, he thinks of everybody in there as part of the family, even if not for blood, even if not by blood. And, and after that session is when it, the word primo was adopted and it went through the company. And, and there's a lot of movements like that, you know, that happen in the company uh, as a result of people coming together. And, and so that's how Primo became the word and how we began developing it in, inside. And when you see the strategy and the culture and the way it's expressed today, we wanted to create not a mandate, but a movement. And we really did reach out to over 200 people in the world. And we started with, here's an idea on white paper and let people just iterate, iterate, and iterate until we arrived at the final. So it was done by the people for the people, if you will. Yeah. And, and it's really owned at all levels. So people understand the three pillars of fearless founders and family and are very proud of it. And what, in fact, uh, the last point I'd make is when we do our survey, uh, our you know, employee engagement survey, we call Primo Engagement, but we get a 90% approval rating on people being proud to be a part of Bacardi and the Bacardi family. 90%. That's, it's just, it, and that's an international survey, you know, so it's just fabulous. That is, that is amazing. Lizanne, uh, I think the audience would love to hear how you define success as it relates to engagement with this, this incredible family. By the way, for those that haven't read the history of this company, uh, the book that Scott mentioned is extraordinary. It's Bacardi and the, and the long fight for Cuba. Uh, it is, it is, it's a, it's a revelation of about what this family and company went through with the expropriation down there and how they've uh, responded to it. But Lizanne, talk about what, what is success in terms of engagement with a thousand, not all thousand can be involved. And I assume there are some that don't want to be involved, which is to, you, you respect that too. And then I know a lot of family business owners would be intrigued, but how, how does this, how does this get funded? Is this a, a Bacardi initiative or, or is, I mean, as a company, uh, cause you can imagine how, how important it is to have a cohesive family behind the company. How, how does this work mechanically just so people know what they could do with their own family? Great, great. Let me let me unpack that. I think I, I think I heard two two questions in there. there so were the first two. one <laughs> is make no you know make make no doubt about it. Um, success is growing our brands, um, being respected, 
uh, and doing the right thing. That, that's success for our business. It's success for our family. It's success for our primos. That, that, that's, that's non-negotiable, as they say. However, within, within the family, and I'm, I'm going to quote one of my, my younger cousins here, um, Enrique Comas. And what he said is that, you know, when we are, we are not owners of this business. We, we are stewards. You know, we have this business. It is our responsibility now. We need to grow it. We need to take care of it. And we need to ensure that it moves on to the next generation. It's not ours now for the taking. And if you think of that con concept, then I would say that success for us within the family is ensuring that we grow our brands, that we, we have this concept of stewardship, and that we do it deliberately, and that we take the best of what has been given to us, and we make it better. And that's what moving into sort of the second part of your question is, okay, you know, how is this funded? How, how has it come about? Um, and unequivocally, it's come about because we had a chairman who valued, saw the importance of it, and saw what a pivotal role it has played in our history, and how it could sustain us in the future. And so that's where both of these programs and several other programs have come from. Uh, now, yes, it is it's supported by the board, which is important. And it is, um, it is also funded by the company to a significant extent. extent. That's great. No, I think, um, I think it's what people need to understand. It, it's an effort to do these things. And boy, absolutely. they're important as the family uh, grows. And I could stay here and share so many more stories with you to show that the, the payback that you get is invaluable. invaluable. I can imagine. Uh, Scott, I, I, this founder concept to me is, is fascinating because, of course, the demise of most family businesses, um, for among other reasons, is that they lose what's called the founder mentality. And what's striking about Bacardi is um, in your eight generations and, and your various leaders, it, it's amazing to me how many truly remarkable family members were able to lead the company. Now, currently you have Mahesh who has gotten just rave reviews by everybody. I, I sort of had a question for you as, as the head of HR and it relates to recruiting top talent to Bacardi. Your board, by the way, uh, is, 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 looks like the, uh, the NBA bench or something. I mean, you got so many talented people with great experience. It's, talk about the importance of having Mahesh running the company as a CEO, having been there 20 years and truly having a founder's mentality and how that helps recruit these people from all over the world, from other highly competitive consumer brand companies to help you at Bacardi. Thank you, Spencer. Great question. And, and finding people who fit is of primary importance to us. And with Mahesh, with you know, 24 years in the company, he's a really good fit. And We've, you know, the, the company has always enjoyed a strong relationship with the family, but under Mahesh's leadership, it's gotten even, even closer. And the way the board interacts, and we, we actually ask board members like Lizanne to help in different sessions and other, other board members, and, and they participate. But when we're interviewing people, uh, as Lizanne said, it's, it's people, brands, and performance. And we start with people, and we start with our cultural pillars. So you can find people who check the box in terms of experience for almost any role out there. We then do a very deep dive, multiple interviews, trying to cross-reference how, how well they fit the Fearless Founders family. And, and we find that people, particularly if they've worked in a family company before, they understand what it means to be part of a family company. And this longer term view versus which, which I, I find uh, very attractive about family companies. It's no longer just trying to make a quarter, trying to make a number for the Wall Street for short term. It really is about making long-term big decisions for the betterment of the business. And I could share many examples of how our board does that and how, as a result, how our management team does that to, to make sure that we advance the company in the right way and with people who believe that. And, and quite frankly, if they don't have that in them, they just won't be successful. 
Interesting. So I've got to ask you, Scott, uh, that that uh, thing behind you on the wall, I, it, I thought it was a bat. Well, tell our audience what that is so they can, this is, I mean, it's not a bat, it's something right. else. Well, yeah, thank you, Spencer. Uh, and in Lazan's video, you saw the picture of our office outside, and this is inside the uh, headquarters of Bacardi. And we've just redone this room, and it is the Patron room. So this is the Patron B, uh, and I'm sitting in here, uh, which is a beautiful room, and really, really captures the spirit of Patron. And it's one of our newest family members, and so we fully embraced it, and and. Uh, now have it well represented in the office. Well, that's fantastic. It's a, it's a, it's a great brand for sure. So yeah. um, people are interested, Lizanne, in you've got, you've got these group meetings and everything of, of family. How does shareholders, you got 425 shares, which is an, an enormous number of shareholders. Do they meet separately or how, how does that work? And, 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 and do you distinguish between the two? Uh, obviously, shareholders need to perform functions. We understand that. But how, how does that work? I mean, are, are, for the development program, are shareholders and non-shareholders treated equally? Right, Just not curious. Right. Okay, yeah, sure. Great question, because it can be very, very confusing. Um, of course, shareholders and shareholders of record are, are clearly designated by um, governance and legal matters. And so that's when I say 425, that would be, you know, the, the shareholders of record and for legal, et cetera. And so typically shareholders will come together at our AGM, which is our annual general meeting, which is held in Bermuda every year. Um, and that, that is um, really what the, the shareholder designation is. Now, obviously, there are many family members that are not necessarily, you know, direct shareholders at the moment. Uh, and so that that's sort of the distinction there. And that is much more of a legal and a governance one than, than anything else. Um, and I think what's important to really bring home here is that regardless of your legal status, um, whether you're a shareholder or not, the, the power of being a family member and the obligation and responsibility that comes with that is what's important here. Um, and so I, I think that, you know, whether it's the, the younger, the eighth generation, the seventh generation, when you're a family member, um, it, it, it's, it's quite important and we take it quite, quite seriously. Um, I hope that sort of answers your question. No, I, I think it is. I, and I think it's, um, and I'll, I'll, I'll turn it over to Scott on this too. I, I think this idea of, of, of a family member's responsibility to the greater greater good, in this case, uh, the Picardi name, the Picardi mission, the, the Picardi family, the primos and all that. Um, I mean, a lot of people are relying on this brand. A brand is a, a profound uh, uh, motivator and uh, a brand can be destroyed as well as created and you've created a heck of one and y you really have to mind how it's respected and everybody has a responsibility for that but but Scott you want to add to that in terms of uh, yeah yeah thank you Spencer um, a, a really important point uh, you know Liz Hahn has has served as the chair of the family development program and, and she talked about stewardship here's a result of that which I think I think is really important is uh, since we've started that initiative and now it's getting ready to start uh, the seventh class, we have more young shareholders or, or young family members who may not be shareholders showing up at our AGM and asking really good questions, really informed questions. And when they come to the different sessions we have every year uh, that we do with Harvard, they, they tell us it is the most valuable weekend of their year because they get to learn about the company, they get to be with some fabulous professors, and they get to know their cousins at a much different level than they would have otherwise. And so what it does is it's bringing that group together. And, and again, it's, we can feel good about what we see in the class, but when we see them at the AGM and asking informed questions, I think that's a testament that stewardship really matters. Yeah, that's a real victory, and I and I know uh, people in the audience are going, <laughs> how how do I get the next the younger generation of my family engaged? What what are the? I mean, you can do it. Can we're do we're it. moaning about that in the United States of of of, of and they're watching video games. They're not interested in business. What what's the secret of getting the younger ones engaged, Lizanne? How do you do that? Well, well, first of all, I know it, it's difficult because they have more energy, right? They're smarter than us, all of that stuff. <laughs> um, I, I really, what I, what I think is so, so valuable here is we, we get them together, right? 
they they want to be together. They, they want to they want to know. I think that's good. Yeah, right. Right, so, right. So don't worry that we're old and fuddy duddy. That's okay. Don't you know? Don't let them see. Don't let them see what's coming. Right. So they're together, and I tell you what, they're engaged. You know, they they know that when they are together, they realize that this is a responsibility. This is something we need to know about. And they're interested. And when you get, you know, you know how you guys know how it is when you get great professors, when you get people who are passionate about the business, the primos that come in to speak, it it will take care of itself. They will engage. But I do think it's critical that you get them together and that you have a, a great engaging and structured program, which which Scott brings every time. Uh, That's so great. Exactly. Thanks. So, so uh, I, go ahead, Scott. Yeah, yeah, and and Spencer, I, you know, I, I think it it really does make a difference having them engaged. And as I said, they rate it so highly. But we did something for the first time this year, uh, Lizana, as you'll recall, with the Emilio Bacardi program, again, the internal one, we do an alumni session where we do a, a virtual session with a professor, case study, et cetera. This year, because of the pandemic, we couldn't get the family development together. So we brought the two classes together. Oh, wow. Gave them wow. the case studies in oh. advance, put them in groups. And oh. I'll tell you, they, you know, again, they're, because of what they do and their understanding of our consumer and how that works, it turned out to be, it's one of those things that was a, hey, why don't we try this? That we, now we look brilliant, right? Because the energy and the ideas that have come from this group that we're still leveraging was phenomenal. And, and what it did to further... I think strengthened the relationship between uh, all the primos, uh, blood primos, and and the company primos to see how we can really work together. Fantastic. That is, I mean, that's really inspiring. I, mean, I can imagine that that would be exciting. You're you're, yeah, you're yeah. treating the younger people as adults, obviously, uh, and then they're with their primo counterparts, and they they get it that they need to be respectful. I think that's wonderful. Um, Lizanne, I, I've been so impressed. Uh, with you um, and your role at Picardi, uh, not not just on the board, but as a as a, just a wonderful spokesperson for the family and Picardi, you you are the uh, archetype of what we call in family business land a family champion. Um, this is a this is a person that that is always there to to rally the troops and see the good side of everything. And I, I was just thinking back, if, can you look back in the history of of Bacardi, the family in particular, of other family champions that came before you? Because it just strikes me that it, it, it's a journey to come to where you are on the road. Um, and there were people before you that must have been, you know, highly praised and respected. Are there a few, any stories about people that sort of kept the family together when, I mean, I can only imagine after the expropriation, but uh, are there any people that come to mind that were your predecessors as family champion? Because you're, you're an ideal example of that. Well, first of all, thank you very much. I'm, I'm, I'm very humbled by those words. Um, you know, in fact, everyone saw one of them today on the video and it was uh, Donia Amalia when she, she came up with putting the bat um, on the bottle, I mean, hey, you know, there were the the literacy rate was maybe one percent or so, and and people could recognize the bat. Isn't that the best marketing ever? There's a there's an unsung hero. Um, however, you know, as we go through our, our our history, they're amazing. I mean, if you think of um, Pepin Bosch, she was the individual who um, took the trademark out of Cuba prior to it being nationalized and wow. moved it overseas. Uh, you know, so you see individuals throughout our history. Um, oh gosh, Juan Prado, this wonderful gentleman. I had the pr uh, absolute privilege of working with him in the 90s. And he was the one who really jump started us in Europe. I mean, he took one suitcase that had some clothes, but mainly bottles. He spoke Spanish at the time. He flew to Spain and he was our first European marketer. It was wow. he a blood relative? No. Was he a primo? Yes. And he was, he was an idol of mine when I worked in the company. Um, just a, a gentleman and the, the epitome of everything you would, you would want your family to be. So yes, I would say that there are individuals sort of dotted um, throughout our history. And it's, it's so neat because at Bacardi, it's almost, you can be there and all of a sudden you're like, but I never heard of this individual and they did this. 
But again, that's just the style within the company um, to, to do what you do, do it well and do it for uh, well, La Familia. I, I, that, that, that's, a, that's a true inspiration. I'll say to the audience, if you have questions, shoot them in. I do have uh, one question that just came in that, that has been on my mind as well. And I, I really am just sort of intrigued with the answer uh, to it that you'd have. The, the, there, there is this um, sense of passion that comes from, from Bacardi generally, and this, you know, this sort of underdog spirit that, you know, that you built this thing and it was taken away, and 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 that whole story is so beyond horrible, um, and and what you made out of it is remarkable too. Um, are you? Is the Cuba connection today um, a lost? Is that a relic today in your in your history, or is it still a is it still an emotional driver of either primos or family? I, I imagine the the older older generation, of course, it's top of their mind still. I'm sure, but how how does that work as the family? disperses is in different countries education's different they, they you know that was so that was uh 60 years ago the company 61 years ago the company was taken away from the family um uh is it still a motivator that was a good question from the audience what yeah what is your oh. response? well wonderful question and i can tell you you know if i asked my my father or, or my grandmother um they, they would they would probably have a very di different answer for sure you know as as the generations come down I think what everyone in the family does realize are the lessons that we can learn and the behaviors that we need to ensure that this company and this family keeps going, regardless of what's going on. I mean, hey guys, this is our second pandemic, right? Um, yes, we, we, did, we did lose Cuba. Um, and, and should we be thoughtful about that? Yes, but we must also look to the future. And, and how we can take those learnings and carry them forward. So um, absolutely from an emotional and a personal perspective, we each share our own views on that. But from a business perspective, again, it, it, it's a, a lesson learned, um, something to be respected, but something to be learned and, and move forward from, sure. Great, yeah. uh, this is more for Scott. Um, a, a question from the audience is, uh, it, it reads all successful families over time have have issues, mental health, addiction, broken families, tragedies. Uh, how, how does the company uh, deal with the, those kinds of issues as it relates to primos or family? Uh, and and how, do you, how do you support your, your constituency in these tough times? I yeah. mean, COVID would be a great example. I, I, absolutely. And, and, and I would start by picking up with what Lizanne said is it is the Bacardi DNA because we, we spend a lot of time going through what the company went through to get to where it is today. In fact, our orientation program is called Becoming Bacardi. Uh, and, and we build into the DNA this fighting spirit and you hear that in Fearless. But in COVID, we, we kind of look at that as this is our chapter to write in the Bacardi story. And, and as a result of that, we have really focused, and I give Mahesh a lot of credit here in the, in the leadership team. When, when the pan pandemic hit, we said the two most important things we're gonna do is take care of primos and take care of the business, and in that order. And in that, we have made well-being a huge focus, but not just internally. We're doing a lot of things internally. We've done, you know, we've done all the, call it the fun things but we also have done the reach out to people. And we've got a very comprehensive well-being initiative for our primos. But in addition to that, you know, bartenders, servers, and the whole industry was virtually shut down overnight. And as you know, a lot of these people live check to check. Uh, and so financial concerns are real, health concerns, mental health. So we took our uh, EAP program and we funded that and made it available to our customers everywhere that we were legally able to do that. And that way they can also call and it's a free call, they get the counseling. So, so we do that internally for uh, all of our primos and their families and all the Bacardi family, but we've now extended that externally. And, and again, we, we shifted dollars from other things to make sure we could offer that uh, around the world with no questions asked. If, if you're part of our business and you need help, you can do that. That's just one small initiative, but our whole well-being initiative is very comprehensive and top of mind for us. 
Well, that, that, that's, that's critical. Another question from the audience, an interesting one, um, and this is, uh, what is the mix of family and non-family on the board? And then is there an additional family board, just, just family members that are not the official board, but the family board? Uh, great, great question. Um, so on our board, we do have a mix of external non-family directors and family directors. We're in the process right now of actually um, reducing the numbers on our board, so, so that, that will change uh, and in, in the next few years. It is imperative and it is a, um, it's a, it's a really, it's not just about bringing and doing what's right for the company, but it's so important to have um, external directors as, as we looked at it. Um, that was, um, again, we, we have wonderful people, you know, I, as you alluded to, I mean, we, ha we have like, you know, um, who should I say now? The Buccaneers, right? We have the Tom Brady's um, on our board. Um, <laughs> fabulous individuals. We have people who have worked within our industry and then also people who have worked in, in industries that are very good proxies. Um, and so that, that is, we believe, the best way forward from a governance perspective. Um, we do not um, have anything else um, sort of, it, you know, some people have like a family council or something like that. We found that um, right now for the business um, and the, the inputs, it is, is certainly um, the balance that we have now. We've had it for several years now. And remember, it wasn't until 1992, prior to 1992, Bacardi was five different companies. Yeah, I think so th that's it. There's been a wonderful evolution that has been led through through sound governance and leading practices, um, together with re respecting the family. There's a there's a balance. Yeah, for those that that are are interested in 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 how family businesses uh, survive this long, I mean, a key element of the story is reinvention, and Bacardi uh, had a reinvention, of course, uh, after 1960. They were sort of forced into reinvention. But the other great reinvention was 1992, when they consolidated these five um, entities in, into one, and the family got behind um, diversification away from rum. Interesting, not not trying to get away from rum, but diversifying brands, um, which, uh, to put it mildly, is it was the key to the future. And uh, beyond that, to become a, a global global brand. Uh, so diversification, different kinds of brands and then uh, truly a global company. Um, I mean, it's so inspiring. It, it, you, you clear the family is sort of the tip of the spear, it seems to me. I mean, it has to be because they own the company um, and, and they're, they're leading it so well. It, it's such an impressive story. Well, with that, I think we've uh, sort of run out of time and it's time for our panel. So I'll uh, say on behalf of our audience here at the Olin School, Scott and Lizanne, this is great. And uh, Bart, back to you for the next part of our program. But thank you, Bacardi family and Bacardi Limited. Fabulous presentation. Thanks. Thank you. Great. Yeah, I want to echo Spencer and thanking both Lizanne and Scott for a really, really wonderful um, hour. A lot of nuggets there. I think I'm kind of digesting a lot of different things that you all said. I think one thing that really struck out to me were the pillars of founder and family and the founder mentality, we've heard that from, we hear that from many family businesses, but also this third pillar of fearless. That's not something that's often associated with family businesses, I think. And that's, that's what I find really unusual. And I expect from your discussion, a real key to uh, the success that Bacardi has had for, for so many years. Um, I also really like the idea of La Familia, La Familia needs you. Um, that's something that... <laughs> I guess that's something you may be excited about, or maybe in some cases it's kind of a scary, uh, a scary call to get, not just from lawyers, but from something like that. But uh, again, really wonderful, wonderful nuggets for us to, to think through. And um, what I'd like to do now is we're going to uh, actually have a panel of family business owners, um, different family business owners reflect on what they learned from Lizanne and Scott. Um, really looking forward to that, how they can take what Bacardi has done and think about how that might apply to their businesses or, or businesses that are in their uh, situations. Um, and to lead that uh, discussion is Gina Hoagland, who's the chairman, CEO, and principal of Collaborative Strategies. For those of you who don't know, and I suspect most people on the call do know, Collaborative Strategies works with many fast-growing companies, both in the Midwest and nationwide. 
in helping them uh, develop their strategies, become fantastic places to work, uh, and so forth. And it's really, I think, added value to many, many clients over the years. So we're very, very fortunate to have Gina join us to uh, lead this um, lead this next hour of our panel discussion. And I'll have uh, Gina introduce Josh, Kevin, and Chris. Okay, Gina, over to you. Thank you, Bart. Thank you very much. And Spencer and uh, Lizanne and Scott, that was just terrific. I have quite a few pages of notes here. Very excited to take us now to the second phase of our discussion today. And uh, I've got three uh, family business people lined up in various, um, various generations, and they're going to share their uh, experiences. But let me start by asking each of them to introduce himself. Just a quick uh, sort of hello. And Josh, you've appeared on my screen, so let me have you start. Good morning, everyone. Thank you, Gina. My name is Josh Hager, and I am in the sixth generation of a family business called Hager Companies. You're from St. Louis, it'd be Hager Hinge. And um, our business was started in 1849, and we make commercial door hardware and residential hinges. We manufacture those in Alabama. And one difference is um, Josh's business, family's business was never expropriated by the government. Not yet. <laughs> okay, let me go to Chris uh, Sayer next, Sayer Industries. Chris? Thanks, Gina. Hi, everyone. My name is Chris Sire, uh, CEO of Sire Industries. We are a third generation uh, family business. Uh, my brother and I run the company. Uh, my brother is president and chief operating officer. And like I said, I'm CEO. My grandfather started it in 1957. So we're 64 years old this year. Uh, we're an aircraft manufacturer. We're located in St. Charles County uh, here in Missouri, just west of the airport. And uh, we have a campus. Uh, all of our manufacturing is done here. And we support companies uh, such as Boeing, Northrop, Lockheed, Gulfstream, Airbus, pretty much all of the big aircraft manufacturers. Thank you, Chris. And I'm about to call on Kevin Maher. Kevin's company, it turns out, is right down the road from Chris's. We found that out yesterday when we were doing our tech call. So Kevin, take it away. Yeah, thank you, Gina. Uh, my name is Kevin Maher, Jr. Um, I am president of St. Charles Automotive, which is St. Charles Nissan, St. Charles Hyundai, and Genesis of St. Charles. We are a third generation uh, automotive dealer. Um, we've also been involved in the billboard industry, real estate development, and we have collision centers. Uh, we got into the automotive industry in 1979 uh, via my grandfather, Frank Pipe, who was uh, one of the first Volkswagen distributors in the Midwest and then continued to grow our operations from there. Um, but happy to be here. And uh, Lizanne, that was very informative. That was in very insightful and what a terrific story. So uh, happy to be on this panel today. All right, well, let's dig in. I'm gonna start in with a, a very general question. What is your family culture? How do you nurture it? And are there things that are similar or different to Bacardi? So let me call on, uh, who'd like to start? I see Josh with his hand up. Let's go over to Josh. All right, so our family, uh, the business is started in 1849. So our culture has definitely changed um, throughout the generations. Um, there's been some things that have been very uh, consistent though. Being customer focused, being very connected to our customers is something that I think every family member that um, I've experienced has been good at and something that we, we definitely encourage in the family. Um, having, um, kind of that good citizen in wherever you exist is important to our family business. Um, we have fun. Um, we, uh, we want to, um, we, we definitely want to grow um, in the ability to do conflict in a healthy and uh, positive way. I think at times we haven't been as good as that. That's something we aspire to, to grow into. Um, and often we value effort, you know, dedication and commitment. And I think that's a very good thing, but sometimes that can come at the expense of performance. And um, I think there's times when we as a company um, and in the desire to value people's efforts, sometimes don't look at the results enough. And um, a lot of family businesses are kind of afraid to become their opposite, right? You know, we don't want to be a big publicly held Wall Street driven. We don't want everyone to be a number. We want them to be part of that, the family and have that family feel. So trying to um, better, um, explain how to value both effort and performance. So we're not there yet, um, but we definitely want to be a fun place to work, have people that are 
humble, they're hungry, they're, you know, some of the Lencioni, um, you know, some of what he describes for sure. Uh, we want engaged employees, and I think that we do that pretty well, but we definitely want to grow in seeking out healthy conflict um, and also in that how do we promote uh, performance culture while still keeping um, the focus on value in our employees. Thanks for starting us out, Josh. I'd call on Kevin or Chris now to add to, to, to talk a little bit about their family culture and how you nurture it and pick up on what Josh and Lizanne and Scott have shared. I'll jump in. Thanks, um, Chris. Sure. Uh, so Scott had commented on engagement and I just heard it uh, from Josh also, but I think a strong culture ultimately resolves itself with employee engagement. And engaged employees are more productive employees, happier employees. And that's what we really focus on. So our business is very different than um, definitely Bacardi in that it's just my brother and I. My dad, uh, he's semi-retired, comes in the office, but the culture, the family influence on our business is my brother, me, and my father. So we don't have a thousand family members influencing decisions, influencing management. Uh, so it's very intentional. So it, it, the longer I've been doing this, the more important culture becomes each year uh, in terms of the success of our business. So our tree is very narrow right now. Uh, again, we're third generation. Fourth generation is still 10 years old or less, you know, still in diapers in some cases. So there's a lot in front of us still before the tree starts branching again. Uh, so a lot is incumbent on, on me and, and my brother. And we actually have um, a special committee. I may, might be too strong of a term, but it's, it's an intentional culture uh, group. And what we do is we look at uh, terms we use, phrases we use throughout the day in meetings and company meetings um, that really tie us together as a group. Uh, you know, strong groups are made from shared experiences, shared sacrifices, shared successes. And so we want to really push uh, those. Uh, we want to use the same words, the same language. So we all hear the same thing and talk the same language. Um, it comes down to stewardship. Lazan talked about that. Uh, you know, our we're a steward. We, we didn't start this. My grandfather started it. So of course, we don't want to be the generation where the business fails or leaves the, the family. Uh, so that's top of mind. And then the last thing I'll just say is that when we, uh, when we look at decisions, um, we look in a, from a longer term lens. I believe Scott commented on that earlier. We are patient capital. We're not looking to make the quarter, quarterly numbers. Um, we make decisions that might not make sense in the short run, but make a lot of sense for the long run for the employees. You know, we have about 250 employees, but we don't look at a, uh, our company as 250 employees. We see the thousand family members throughout all the households and the decisions we make affect a much bigger number of people than just the employees at Sire. Thank you, Chris. Kevin, can I call on you now? Absolutely. So Chris, uh, a lot of what you said uh, echoes with our family and our culture as well. Uh, so I have an older brother, Ryan, uh, and it's my brother, uh, my dad and I, our grandfather has sent, uh, passed away, but I absolutely agree with what you said and what, uh, what also uh, Lizanne said, uh, that we are stewards of our companies and we didn't start this. Uh, it is my goal and our family's goal that as we continue to grow, and I'd like to say we're, we're somewhat um, of the same stance that we're not the, the hare, we're the tortoise, we're plotters, we don't make uh, rapid decisions, and we're not looking for that thousand percent exponential growth um, going to be on the New York, <laughs> New York Stock Exchange anytime soon. Uh, we're very thoughtful and intentional about what we do because we want to uh, pass something on to the next, <clears throat> next generation and be good stewards of our organization. Um, talking about our culture, you know, we, we grew up around the car business specifically and, uh, and the billboard business as well. And I remember my first job when I was 12 years old is I would pull weeds on, on the lot and I would go, uh, go get coffee for, or do whatever was needed of me. And there were a lot of things that I was learning about culture from a very young age that didn't resonate back then. And it wasn't until, uh, you know, post-college years and having some work experience that I really started to understand that a lot of the values that I embody today, I learned from the ages of 12 to 18 years old. You know, it's uh, even still to this day, when my dad's uh, out here, we'll walk the lot or we'll go from one building to the other. And if there's a piece of trash on the ground, you better believe it that either my dad or I are picking it up because that resonates with people. And the employees and customers see the owner or the president or a general manager walking around it 
uh, they see you taking care of your building uh, that way, then everyone else will also continue to follow, follow that lead, so. And uh, I see uh, people in the comments picking up on that shared experience, shared successes and shared sacrifices that really bond and create, contribute to that culture. Kevin, I love the story of the, if you see a piece of trash on the lot, you pick it up. I say that about collaborative strategies, client base. That's like, that's the owner mentality of that. I got to handle that right now. Absolutely. Um, let me ask a little bit about how is culture a strategic advantage in your business? What do you, what do you, how are you um, putting that to work for your business or how is that giving your business um, advantages? And I, I'll take uh, whoever would like to start from our panel. Sure. I, I have an example uh, as I was uh, thinking through this. Um, I talked about it already, but the patient capital side um, in, in our world in aerospace manufacturing uh, it's very fragmented, a lot of family businesses, a lot of small enterprises competing. And over the last five, seven years, there's been a lot of consolidation. Um, a lot of private equity, financial buyers have come in. And uh, you know, as most of you know, financial buyers often have, uh, they already know when they're gonna sell you and for how much before they even buy you. So they do what it takes to get to that cost number, those profit numbers, and uh, oftentimes at the expense of the long term of the business. So <clears throat> how is culture a strategic advantage for us? We literally, the first slide, back when we were actually meeting with customers in person, uh, the first slide of our presentation, our sales pitch was, we are family owned, privately held. And that has gotten us more business in the last five years than probably anything else we've put up there because they know we're not gonna get bought, we're not gonna be flipped, we're here for the long term. So the whole patient capital idea uh, resonates really strongly and has become a strategic advantage for us. Terrific, thank you, Chris. You know, uh, I, think, yeah. I think at our company, um, it's done two things. Um, there's, there's more, but it, it really has helped with recruitment. Um, we, we've been able to find a bunch of people that were really talented that wanted, um, wanted a different place to work, whether it be valued, whether it be a long-term focus, there'd be a family feel. And um, as we've upgraded um, in HR and uh, started to tell that story better, um, we've been able to recruit great people. And they, they love um, a lot of what a family business has to offer. The stability, the, the fact that they can actually talk to a family member. They, if, you know, if, um, something is bad for a month or for a few months, the focus is long-term. It's going to be to um, to get to where we need to go, and it's not going to just be looking at something month by month. We need to look at those that those numbers; they're very important. But being patient is something that um, our competitors don't do. Um, there, our three biggest competitors are all um, large publicly um, traded companies that are in the billions of dollars, and um, they have they sell a lot of product. But with our customers, they know they have a partner in Hager, somebody who's willing to. Um, I mean, as an owner, call them back if they have a problem and uh, they know that we're going to be direct and honest because we're not perfect. And you know, even right now, we're having some challenges with um, implementing a new warehouse and I'll be leaving today to go down to our facility in Alabama and being able to tell a customer, look, here's what's really going on. Here's really when we're going to be out of it. And I'm actually personally going to be involved. And so is my cousin. And that they're not hearing that from from someone else and our competitors are more focused on their monthly numbers than they are their own customers. So for us, it, it you know, from getting employees in to that sales call, when you can say something very different than someone else, um, those are two ways that our culture has helped us. Yes, that's terrific. So patient capital, recruiting, the personal involvement of the owning family. I see some parallels too with the Bacardis. Kevin, what would you add to that? Yeah, so for our uh, uh, family company specifically, uh, one of the biggest parts of our culture is tenure. Uh, when we hire someone, we're trying to hire them for not a one-year time or a two-year. It's not a job. We're looking to hire people for a career. And people know that about our organization. And when they, they come in, 99% of the time, we only promote from within. And when people get into management with us, uh, they stay in that position for quite a long time, uh, specifically uh, our service manager just retired after a 39 uh, long 
uh, 39 year long career with us. And the average tenure of our management, uh, which we have eight managers, is about 17 years, which is pretty unique in, in the, uh, the car business. Um, right after college, I actually worked for AutoNation, which they're based in uh, Fort Lauderdale, or a Fortune 200 company. And uh, it was very different down there because, again, it was all about the numbers. And you were only as good as your last month. And if you weren't moving forward, you were dying. And they had a motto there that it's train, train, replace, which I thought sounded pretty good. But in theory, <laughs> but in, in practicality, train, train, replace actually means strike one, strike two, strike three, you're out. <laughs> and uh, we do not embody that those values. Uh, we will give everybody the opportunity for extra training. We want to bring people along. We don't want to leave people in the dirt behind us. And people are very well aware of that. And that's part of our biggest value prop, not just for our employees, uh, for retaining employees and bringing new employees on also for our customers because a customer knows that if they come in and they purchase a vehicle or service a vehicle that whoever they're dealing with at that point they're going to be there a year down the road they're going to be there five years down the road and that's really helped us um, especially over the past couple of years as there's been a lot of consolidation in the, in the auto space also a very fragmented industry just uh, Chris like what you were saying um, and customers know that about us and uh, we think that that's one of the reasons that we have one of the highest retention of uh, repeat customers uh, for both Nissan and Hyundai dealers in the country. Um, and it's just something that we hold near and dear to our hearts and we're not looking to change anytime soon. Thank you, Kevin. One of the reasons that these three panelists uh, was so great that they were willing to do this is of course, they've been, it's multi-generational. I'd love a sense of uh, how has culture changed in your family business over the years? You know, what's been good about some of those changes? Maybe have you lost something that you wish you hadn't lost? I know with some of my clients, the founder will stop in every once in a while and kick the tires and be like, nothing's the way it was when I started this place. And it's <laughs> like, well, we've had to evolve, but I'd love to get a sense from each of you. Who'd like to start? Yeah, I can go. We, um, sure. So, in six generations, as you can imagine, there's a lot of different types of leaders. Um, our family, um, my uncle Rusty um, and uh, my grandfather actually uh, did a lot of work to narrow in who the ownership group is. And um, to be pretty candid, some of that was because uh, the culture of certain executives didn't match up with some of the other family executives, really where we wanted to go. Sometimes it was someone wanting to retire. In other cases, it was actually removing a family member. And um, part of that was because you had somebody who just did not embody what we wanted from our company. And if they're an owner and they're speaking um, on behalf of the family and they're really out of alignment with the rest of the family, then you have to deal with it. And, um, you know, 20, 30 years ago, um, we had some significant gaps between how parts of the family were running the business and other parts were running the business. And, you know, we had to deal with that. And I'm fortunate that the generation above did a lot of work on that. Um, so we now, our ownership really is back to my grandfather since passed away. If you know, Bill Hager, you probably smile as I'm talking about him. He's a real character. And, um, you know, uh, he, he actually pulled me into his office one time and he's 6'4", he's 6'4", deep voice, just a character. Everyone loved him. He, he could talk you into doing anything and you'd heard the same story and you'd, you'd smile because you're ready to hear it again. Well, he called me into his office and he said, Josh, when I talk to you and I figured he was going to, I was young, 27, 28, I figured he was going to tell me a story about something about one of his friends, but he looked at me, he had really, really colorful language. So I'm not going to say the exact word, but he said, Josh, and I was the only one in my generation. I said, Grandpa, what's going on? He said, Josh, don't be the generation that Fs it up. And I was like, I just got kind of big. And he, uh, he, I thought he would joke or laugh or like, I'm just kidding. It's okay. But he just let it sit. And um, I said, okay. Uh, yes, sir. And that was the end of that conversation. And you know, that was not really his style, but it sat um, pretty heavy, as you can you'd imagine. And uh, the idea of stewarding a business or writing a few chapters is how I describe it as well in our history. He was very customer centric. And when some of our other families were more focused on, um, you know, I'm an owner or, you know, leading with kind of ruling with an iron fist, um, that just had to be dealt with. So 
Um, our culture changed quite a lot, and I've referenced that I would like to see some more changes. You know, steward, grow, nurture the good stuff, but I do think you kind of have to kill and mourn part of your culture that you want to get rid of and be very direct and honest about that. And um, valuing effort versus performance, you know, those don't have to be in contrast or conflict, and also seeking out healthy conflict um, so that you don't create this big void that a bull in a china shop or an aggressive person plows into um, are two ways we, we still need to change. Um, so long answer to a short question, but it's a long story and um, it's a good question. Yeah, a lot of generations. So it's, I'm sure there's been change. Kevin or Chris? Yeah, so uh, I'll jump in. Um, so Josh, I, I thought that was a, a great story. <laughs> Uh, about your grandfather sitting you down. And I'm, I'm sure the hair stood up on the back of your neck when, when that happened. That's a, a, a good conversation to have, but it puts things into perspective. Um, so not having six generations like uh, Josh's family company does, you, you know, we're third generation. Um, and I would say our culture has been relatively consistent over the years. Um, my grandfather, his, his name was Frank Pipe. He came up with these uh, action items called Pipeisms, and there's 10 of them. And they're basically life lessons uh, conduced down to one sentence. Uh, and those are a lot of the things that we still uh, have as our core beliefs and philosophy for how we're going to do things. And we'll be sitting in the, uh, the executive conference room and there will be a tough decision and everyone will just kind of go silent for a second. And lo and behold, we all look up at the wall where they're all post all the pipeisms are posted and we'll say, you know what? This is a really relevant example. Let's go ahead and discuss this pipeism right now. And I kid you not, we'll sit there and we'll talk about this was something from 40 years ago that we're still using as a relevant example today. So our culture has been pretty steady. Uh, we're always looking for ways to improve our culture, obviously. Um, but I, I like the term that Chris has, has said a few times now about being patient capital. Uh, we are the, we're plotters. We're very intentional about what we do. We don't make aggressive or, um, decisions without having consensus and buy-in. Um, an example that I'll bring up is when I first came back uh, after working with AutoNation for four and a half years and uh, started working with our automotive company, uh, you know, six weeks in, I realized I said, our CRM is awful. It is completely broken and we've got to change this right now, right now, we've got to go. And it took a couple months to really get some buy-in and some consensus from leadership. Everyone was saying, look, if it's really broken, let's go through this entire vetting process. We'll send out an RFP. We'll, we'll reach out to the vendors. We're not just going to sign up for the first shiny object that we see. And thank goodness we, we did that because we ended up looking at about seven or eight different uh, uh, CRM providers, all the way from Salesforce, all the way down to the smallest uh, new player in town. And finally, we, we made the right decision and we've been with that CRM provider now for five years and, it, and it's working, but being intentional and thoughtful and getting buy-in and consensus, not just from you know, the, the C-suite office, but getting sales manager buy-in, uh, sales people buy-in and saying, here are the different products. And at the end of the day, we have to make the decision as leaders of the organization, but getting consensus and buy-in and not just ripping off a bandaid and saying, this is broken, we're doing this and you all figure it out. Uh, that's, that's one of the things that we, we hold near and dear. So. Thank you, Kevin. And, uh, uh, Chris, I'm going to have you address that change in culture over the years. And then I have a specific question for you from, from the audience, but please go ahead. Sure. Um, so our culture, <clears throat> I don't know, I'll call it a, a challenge, which has come with change. So we've grown quite a bit over the years. And uh, we have a, a contingent of employees, just like Kevin was commenting. A lot of our employees have been here for 30, some 40 years. And it's kind of the old guard and the new guard, not to separate employees by class like that. But the old guard are folks that worked with my grandfather. He was old school. Uh, what he said went, you don't ask questions, ruled with the iron fist. As we've grown bigger, um, we now run 24 seven. We have, you know, people, I don't see certain employees uh, throughout the day. I only see them at company events or, or all hands meetings. So our challenge is as we've grown, how do you keep the culture consistent? Um, how do you push the message um, to everyone equally as much as possible? And um, <clears throat> get the words here. Um, so at, we have a saying here at, at the company, at, in order to get bigger, you have to get smaller. Meaning when we were smaller, you wore a lot of hats. You did a lot of jobs. 
And as we get bigger, your, your scope narrows. And 30 years ago, you had a problem to resolve. You go to my grandfather, Lou. Uh, today, we have a little more process, a little more formality. And so some of the struggles we run into are the old guard not necessarily wanting to go through the process. They wanted to be the old school, come right to the, the CEO. And we're not huge on process, but you have to respect the fact we're larger and things are a little different today. So our culture has changed in that um, we kind of, I, I believe, I think I learned in business school at, at Olin, uh, I think I heard the term for the first time, uh, there's a gene, you know, a concept of a genius with a thousand helpers, which is your, you know, founder mentality, your entrepreneur, and everyone goes to that person for all the answers. Um, that's how we started with grandpa. And today, uh, you know, we're just much different and uh, transitioning the culture to <clears throat> what we are today versus what we were 30 years ago. Uh, we, we've done a good job. It's just, there's a very clear uh, distinction between the folks that have been here a long time versus the newer employees. So I don't know if that's a, a good answer, but that's what came to mind. Well, it plays right in, Chris, to the question we got, which was how do you balance patient capital with employee performance and letting go if necessary? So I know we kind of sprung that on you. If you're yeah. ready to jump in, please do. Otherwise, I can also try to call in Josh or Kevin. <clears throat> sure. Um, so one of, uh, personally, for, for my own development um, and for the company in general, one of the challenges we have are knowing when um, someone has hit their ceiling or knowing when you have to change course. Uh, it's really tough. You, you want to give, me personally anyway, you want to give someone the benefit of the doubt, give them a second, third chance. But what I've learned over the years and what we're getting better at is that recognizing, all right, you have to match the person with the position. And so you want to be patient. You want to invest in the individual for the long term, but you also have to balance that against reality. Um, we lean heavily on our advisors. So we do use collaborative strategies um, as an outside advisor. We use, that's right. We use on another firm as well for different things. Um, but using those outside resources to, as uh, third party data points to support a decision, to make the move a tough decision uh, sooner rather than later. So it, it's just really honestly a balancing act, I think, to answer the question. Um, you you want to look at the long term always, but you also have to recognize and match the individual with the position. Josh or Kevin, anything to add to that balancing patient capital, but also, uh, you know, needing to get employee performance? I know, Josh, you spoke a little bit about valuing results, not just efforts, but anything to add to that? Sure. Yeah, we, uh, we're pretty good at getting rid of people that are mean or bad or all the negatives, but we're, we're really not great at dealing with people trying hard that aren't successful. So um, I think that's true of a lot of family businesses. We, um, we want to be caring and sometimes we project nice or caring into a situation where uh, if someone's not pulling their weight, people around them are having to do more work. And um, most of the time when we replace a person, there's a certain group of people that wonder why we didn't do it sooner. Um, and the hardest people to deal with are really long tenured employees that the, that the company's outgrown um, some of their skills. And uh, at times we're able to fit them in at other places in the organization and other times uh, we can't do that. And um, it's the, probably the hardest part, I think for me and for a lot of leaders, but um, every time we've replaced a person or I've been involved, I probably could have done it sooner. And I think that's probably true of a bunch of family businesses as well. So, you know, that performance part, if it's not there, then you just keep saying try harder and try harder and try harder. And then all of a sudden they're in a situation where they can't try any harder because they're fully dedicated. They're doing all that they can and they're still not successful. And, you know, our competitors are huge companies and we want to value people, but the nice culture, you know, it isn't nice to, to hide or to not talk about someone's, failures or someone's areas for development. And uh, it's actually much more kind to work with them on how they're failing and what to do to improve it and give them clear goals. And um, we're getting better at that, but um, we have a lot of very long-term employees and our company's had to change quite a bit over the years, especially as we broaden out from hinges into locks and access control products and all these things. So um, we're a work in process there, um, but um, it is a, it is a focus and our HR department is better about it. We've, we've 
Paul, one of our four corporate goals for the year for 2021 is culture. And part of culture we're having to explain is development. But I think you have to do that at the very top of the organization. So I personally have to make changes. And then it's easier for me to tell others to make changes. So, um, Thank you. And Kevin, I'm going to read a specific question for you, which is a kind of a color color to this. With such long tenures in management positions, how do you encourage employees whose definition of growth and development includes promotions? You know, it's that famous, you know, we think up is better, right? The hierarchy, but often in family businesses, we're pretty flat. Um, can you comment on that, Kevin? Sure, absolutely. So um, there are se several different verticals for upward mobility in the, in the auto space. Remember, uh, uh, a car dealership isn't just a car dealership. You really have five businesses operating with, within one organization. You have fixed operations, which is parts and service. Uh, you have new car sales. You have financing. Uh, you have used car sales. And then you've got accounting and, and support staff. So if someone happens to be on the variable side, which would be sales or finance or, or sales management, sure, there's a vertical to, to navigate up. Um, if there happens to not be an opening and there's not an opening in the foreseeable future, there's always a different track that someone could go down to try and uh, broaden their, uh, their knowledge of the entire auto industry. Uh, and it's not uncommon for people to jump between departments or get co-trained in different departments. Um, at our organization though, there is a finite uh, number of management positions. And uh, a lot of times people will just wait it out because they know that if it's, they want to get promoted within a year or two years, but it might not be a five or seven year event horizon. Well, it makes sense for them to do that because they know that once they get to that position, they've earned it. And we're not going to do anything to force them out the door or say, you know, you, you missed your numbers by 1%, too bad, so sad, you're, you're heading out. Um, and so for our organization, people, I would say, are in it for the long haul. Uh, they know what the other side looks like. We, we have 130 employees, and again, there's only eight management positions, and you know who the go-getters are, the people who want to get to one of those positions, and you also know the people who are happy being a, a service advisor or a technician or, or a sales associate. Um, so the, there is opportunity. There is a finite amount of opportunity, um, but the cream will always rise, rise to the top, and when that time comes, those people are, are, are in place, and we've groomed them for that transition in that period and uh, they're in it for the long haul and we're in it for the long haul with them as well. Thank you, Kevin. And um, if my recollection is correct, I think all of you have worked in a non-family business. You haven't only had experience in your family's business. One of the questions we have is, how is culture different in a family business, in your family business, versus when you've had direct experience in a non-family business? So I'll, I'll jump in on this one. Uh, so r right out of college, when I was uh, uh, 21, uh, I literally packed up my car, moved down to South Florida and uh, Delray Beach. I knew AutoNation was down there. I knew that they're the, the 800 pound gorilla in the room. And I said, that's where I want to go learn because that's where I want to get trained. And I want to learn as much as I can and be a sponge for however long I'm going to be going to be down here. Um, I, I loved my time with AutoNation. I would not be where I am now without having that, those experiences and touching various departments and learning what I did, really learning how a publicly traded um, company is. And it's all about metrics. It's all about KPIs. But frankly, with that being said, you are just a number at the end of the day and you feel it from time to time. And you always feel like someone's trying to get one over on you because at the end of the day, the company reports to the shareholders. They don't report to the president, CEO or founder. Um, so it, it was different. Uh, you always kind of had that itch in the back of your head, like, am I doing good enough or, or am I doing well enough? And do, am I going to have a job in the next six months or, you know, are, are things moving in this direction? Whereas with our organization, I'm out here six days a week and uh, I have an open door policy. Anybody can walk into my office at any time and talk about uh, talk about an issue that they might be having. Luckily, we don't, we don't have a lot of uh, inner turmoil and, and strife and issues that re require that coming in and to play. Uh, but people know that I'm here. If someone needs to get a hold of me, they can walk into my office. They're not a number. If someone wants to go offside and grab lunch, I mean, it, it's a, a unique opportunity because it is a family business and they are talking to the owner or the, the heir apparent and uh, however you want to quantify that versus when I was with AutoNation for four and a half years and I saw it was Mike Marini back then, who was the chief operating officer. He visited uh, one of the stores I was working at 
one time. And he walked around, he shook hands with everybody, but that was it. It was one opportunity to, to meet the, the leader of the organization. And, you know, they had 300 stores at the time. He can't go to every single store. That would be a full-time job just shaking people's hands. They had more, more things to do, but you just, you felt like you were on the team, but at the end of the day, you still felt like a number. And we never want anyone to feel like a number here. We want to have those uh, interpersonal relationships and make sure that people feel valued, feel like they're on the team, feel like they, they know where we're going um, and how we're all pulling in, in the same direction to get there. Yeah, and I think we saw that significant investment from Bacardi in the, in the Primos and what they're doing with that, with trying to cultivate Absolutely. that across a multi-nation you know, global operation. I'll, I'll, I'll go next here. Yeah. Sure. Um, so yeah, I worked out of college. I worked for a publicly traded financial company. Um, and I think the one word to sum up the difference is politics. And Kevin pretty much said it, uh, but it was, you get ahead through political maneuvering. And um, it maybe didn't realize, at least I didn't necessarily realize it at the time, but you realize that once you remove yourself and you kind of come to the family business and you see how different things are with how decisions are made, with what defines success. Um, so we at, at Sire Industries, we really work to have an apolitical organization. If you have a problem with someone, we put you in the room and we have a discussion. We don't let things fester. We don't form alliances. We don't form pillars. Um, so I just got a kind of a shorter answer here, but politics was definitely probably the biggest difference that I saw from a large company to a family company. Yep. Yeah, Josh, so my, that? yeah, sure. My experience was earlier on. So I, at my, um, I, all the new family members coming in have to work three years outside the company. So, you know, kind of having to earn your stripes somewhere else was very beneficial. Um, I also lived in Hong Kong for my first two years at the company and kind of seeing the perspective of how huge the world is and getting outside of St. Louis and my own culture and even my own family was very beneficial. Um, but one of the things I'd say it's a key difference is just the timeframes of things, right? So we're doing a bunch of capital investments and, you know, ROIs are super important. We need to do those to them well, but, you know, there's just projects that would not get approved. Um, decisions, even product, new product development that wouldn't get approved if you were somewhere that had a different and shorter term focus. Um, so we've talked a lot about culture. That's certainly very different, but um, even the way decisions are made would be very, very different. Um, taking a long-term approach on having an organization that's efficient, that's, that's more modern than it is today, that has the right tools to be successful, that doesn't all have to get done in a year or in two years. You can get there slowly and make sure you make the right choices um, on technology and equipment, things like that. Josh, Josh you made the comment that everyone uh, who works for Hager, they have to spend three years outside. Is that, is that a requirement or a request or how, how does that work? So for all family members who come in, um, you have to have three years outside experience. Um, I was a guinea pig on that one. And at the time I was very unhappy about it. And uh, that was, uh, I found out my senior year of college and uh, looking back on it, it was great. It was really good. It had another be benefit that was kind of unrelated, but one of the years I was a flight instructor and think about the Sands helicopter flying and it's super impressive, but as opposed to being 44 and wondering whether I should have been an airline pilot or, you know, <laughs> And, you know, getting a motorcycle in a midlife crisis, I'm very, very confident that I don't want to be in that industry and want to be working for the family business. So gave me a chance to learn, but also to make sure that I really should be at Hager. And uh, my cousins who are all younger than the Generation 6 have been through that program. And I, I think that's, it's been a huge help. It takes a lot of self-control to do that because, you know, a lot of parents want to get their kids off their payroll and get them. Uh, employed by the company and oh, they want to get them starting to make a difference and all of us want to come in and make our mark and do these things but those three years were um, were really really good and I would um, I think it'd be something we would never change if we did anything we would have more requirements like that so family members that come in really are supposed to be there make it over a higher bar um, so it self-selects them out earlier rather than you know 20 years into their career um, and that's, that's a lot more challenging. Thing, so. Yeah. Working outside the business before going into the family business is certainly a recognized best practice. And you see it over and over again in the, in the literature and the research. 
hundred percent agree. Josh, I'd venture a guess if you ch if you change your mind and you say you want to start flying again, Chris will build them. You fly them. <laughs> I know how helicopters are made, and I don't want to get in one. I'm sorry, guys. <laughs> we had another question here, and I think we could maybe uh, blend it in with what we heard from Bacardi too. The question is, how do you intentionally develop leadership skills for your employees? And you know, you think about what we heard from Bacardi and what they do for their primos. Um, I'd be interested in that question and maybe even adding the twist to it. And how does that mesh with your culture? So let me ask uh, one of you to address that. How do you intentionally develop leadership skills for your employees? So that's our, a version of that is actually our number one strategic priority um, for our company. And that this has come out of the fact that we've grown from a small company to a larger company now, and it's requiring different skill sets that, you know, we've attempted to promote from within and sometimes it works uh, and we're finding that it doesn't in a lot of cases. And so the need to have a much more formal development program uh, was very apparent. And so what <clears throat> we're learning, so I, I don't have a, you know, a great answer here other than this is, we're starting that journey this year and we're using a combination of internal training and external training from third parties, again, like collaborative strategies and others, um, so this is kind of our first, the first inning for us in our development uh, strategy. So I'm, I'm interested to hear what, what Josh and Kevin say uh, on this question. So Gene and I, um, the, our journey, um, the, this is my part of it, right? So my part of the story. For me, it started with a business coach. You know, I mean, if, if you're running the company, um, you have to do a lot of work on yourself. And uh, Mark Tom was my business coach. I learned a ton from him. He's off running a big company right now. And become a good friend. But what I realized was um, if I truly wanted to develop people around me, I needed to develop in some areas myself. Um, my cousin Johnston has a business coach as well. That's been great. So at the top level, you got to, you got to work. We also had to bring in some people from outside to help us with that process. Um, we have a continuous improvement program that is being launched in our factory in Alabama. It's going to do a lot of training as we integrate people. So we started off at the very beginning. Our culture in Alabama is a bit different than it is here in St. Louis with our headquarters. Um, and in St. Louis, um, our head of HR has started Hager University, which is a training program that's all based on um, short 10 to 15 minute um, sessions. Most training in our industry are hour and they're technical. They're very, they're very kind of laborious. Um, they can be good if you're technically minded, but you know, the shorter snippet of time is more valuable. We have fitting 15 minutes and is easier. We've also had to really be more formal about people's development plans. And it gets back to that healthy conflict part where you say you're really good at this, you're not so good at this, here's what we're gonna to do to help you. And if you wanna be promoted, um, here are the tools needed to, to make it into that job. But we've definitely had to sprinkle in some real talent from outside the organization and promote from within. Um, to get there and uh, we still have work to do for sure. But um, the honesty needed to truly develop a person um, requires a lot of healthy conflict. And, um, you know, telling somebody that they're not great at something and they're going to need to develop for the job to keep the job or to develop to get promoted, is a, it's a, it can be a conversation that once it's familiar, can be a great conversation, it can be encouraging, it can be honest, and sometimes people are more afraid of the unknown than they are the truth that's there, right? Especially if they trust their boss. So um, it, it, we, we try to do it from top to bottom and um, make sure that um, we're able to usher out some people that are blockers in that process. And an old company is going to have some, some heavy, deep ruts and, uh, Sometimes getting out of those ruts um, is a challenge. Other times the ruts kind of keep you from going off the rails too far. So there's some good in it too, but um, we're still a work in process on this. Kevin, anything to add to that? Yeah, so uh, Josh, I think it's fascinating that you guys are doing the, this Hager U. And uh, I, I love the fact what you said that it's 15, 20 minutes max, something like that. So uh, we, we also did something almost identical to that. We used to have uh, weekly trainings that would last on average 60 minutes, sometimes 90 minutes. Uh, we finally realized that you, 45 minutes in, sometimes 20 minutes, and you start getting that glazed over, glossed over look. 
you've lost attention, the retention, uh, you've lost attention and the retention of materials not there anymore. We no longer do any meeting longer than 60 minutes. If it's a, a training or a touch base, anything like that, we try to do 15, 20 minutes, discuss a topic, one topic, uh, and move on with the day. Uh, we found that we, we can do more trainings, more touch base meetings. Uh, so instead of doing once a week and everyone walks into the room and they're grumbling saying, oh, here comes a 90, another 90 minute meeting. And what are we talking about today? People are energized. They're coming in saying, what's the one topic we're going to focus on today? And that's for all departments. That's for parts, service, sales, accounting. I mean, it doesn't matter what it is. Um, talking about one topic, hitting the high levels, bottom line up front, this is what we're going to discuss. This is why we're discussing this uh, and getting into the content. And then you're in, you're out. Uh, so that, that's a really interesting topic that you brought up. But I also think it's important to note the difference between training and coaching. Uh, training you can do in a group setting. Training you can do online. Training you can do uh, via a Zoom. Coaching is a very different element. And training only gets you so far. There comes a point where you can't just say this is how you need to do it. You need to bring people along, uh, especially with new hires. Uh, you can't just put them in a room in front of a computer and say, here's your onboarding video. Let me know if you have any questions. You really need to set the expectation, say, this is what we're going to cover. Here's why we're covering it. Now let's role play some of the things that we just, that, that we just learned. Um, and and it, it tells people more about not just the how, but the why. Um, so that's been something that big changes that we've made in terms of training and uh, um, people are just much happier with how things are moving now. I'm, uh, I'm going to kind of start to bring us home here with the last question or two. Let me focus in on uh, that whole description Lizanne gave of La Familia and getting the call from, from the, the family that you're needed. Um, I think that's rooted in maybe like a European sort of global, uh, uh, um, like the family comes first. And in the United States, of course, we're, we've got this <clears throat> strength in individual, you know, pick your up pick yourself up by the bootstrap. Certainly when I listen to the stories of your founders of your companies, it was somebody, you know, kind of making it happen, starting as a blacksmith or, you know, figuring out how to get it done. Could you talk a little bit about uh, your experience of like the individualistic versus the family and how does that manifest itself in, in your company? Maybe a little compare and contrast with Bacardi. Sure. Um, with our, with my experience is a little bit more like, some of the Bacardi stuff. So I mean, my first call I got was to move to Hong Kong uh, being newly married, right? So my wife and I got married and moved to Hong Kong for two years. And it was, we need someone there because we had a joint venture at the time, which we've since got out of um, trying to make more stuff in the US. But at the time we thought we'd have to be there. And so getting that call, um, you know, I can relate to that. Um, I think that the way our family is and the way our family business is, um, my approach has been trying to fit um, into what's needed, not to make it about how I am. Um, and that's partly because the ownership spread out and there's a lot more than just me around and, you know, a lot of um, other very important family members. And so uh, we are very individualistic in our country, but having lived outside of the country and, and, and kind of the, the burden and the responsibility of providing for a lot of other people, Kind of, I think, forces you or, or, or should force you into trying to be who's needed, not who you want to be. And, um, you know, that requires a lot of growing pains. That requires stretching and changing. And um, so you need good people around to help with that process. Um, and uh, but, so my experience is definitely a little bit probably in contrast to some of the typical American culture experiences. Thank you, Josh. So we're up. Uh... I, I kind of mentioned this earlier. I don't, I don't have a great answer here. We're uh, a small family at this point in terms of the business. So the, the bigger family, La Familia, um, hasn't really applied. My, my dad bought out his siblings 30 years ago. So it was just my dad. And then my brother and I now are, are owners with my father. And um, so we don't have this big spread out family all over the country or the world. So you know, we're kind of, I'm kind of looking into the future here, you know, because I have kids, my brother has kids and, you know, that family tree will grow over time. And so this is, for me, this is good to learn about what other companies are doing, how to manage the, the family and uh, kind of things we need to put in place now. So we're not stumbling down the road when, when we have to make this stuff happen. 
Thank you, Chris. Kevin, anything to add? So Chris, we're in very similar situation. Uh, again, third generation is just uh, dad who, DAD is CEO <laughs> and uh, uh, my brother and I are, are handling our, our own verticals right now. But uh, I remember when I was working for AutoNation, I think I had plans of working there for about two years right out of college, maybe two and a half. And I remember my brother and I, we would talk on the phone and he'd say, you know, how are you doing? I say, oh, we're doing so great. You know, we're 10% up this month, we're 15% up. And I just remember he'd be like, oh, can't you just come back to St. Louis? You know, you could be doing this for our, our family business. Like, why can't you grow our family business uh, in, 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 the, in these ways? And I just said, you know, I'm, I'm on a good trajectory. I'm learning. I, I keep getting promoted, which, which was a, which was a good thing. Um, and then I remember after four years, I came back for Christmas one day and uh, or one year. And uh, my dad says, hey, why don't we go out to the dealerships and why don't we just sit down and talk? I said, sure. You know, not abnormal, but I, I wonder what he wants to talk about. And uh, we get out there and it was a Saturday and our CFO and COO and my dad were there and sat us down and sat me down and said, uh, you know, we really think it's time that you come back. We've heard you're doing great things. You know, you, we, we talk shop, we touch base, and now would be a really good time for you to come back and start, you know, creating your, uh, your own legacy and really get involved with our family business. And I remember I, I said, well, I'd like to look at a few numbers. I'd like to see where we're at. And I, I looked at them and I said, well, that number can't be right. And they said, well, why, is, why can't that be right? I said, well, that number's too small. And they said, well, if you can come in and change it, by all means, come, come in and change it. And it, I connected the dots with what my brother and I had been talking about for two and a half years. And I said, I should come back. We do need to grow La Familia. And this is all good things. And uh, it was a very quick decision after that point, because I, I having the, the curtain pulled back a little bit and seeing more of, of the numbers, I was only 25 years old. But I said, you know, we could really move the needle and this is going to be good for everyone. And this is, um, this is all about the family and putting the family first and uh, taking the skill set that I've learned and bringing it back and helping to grow uh, our family company. So but I remember that driving out here, <laughs> driving out to St. Charles and uh, it was just still resonates with me today. Wow. All right. Last question for today, coming in from our studio audience. I was intrigued with the ongoing focus of Bacardi family to protect the family brand, as well as the company brand, even among non-shareholders. How do your families address this issue? I could start out here. Um, I think our brand is, after this many years, it's it's our most valuable asset we have. Our culture, maybe you could meld those together into one, but our brand is, uh, it means something. You're putting your last name on a product that you're selling that's ending up, you know, in buildings around the world. And um, to me, it's more important to protect the brand than any individual one of our um, family members wants or desires. And that's, I think it's a strong statement, but I think it's, it's, it's more important than any one of us are. We lose our brand. Our competitors are huge. Uh, they could squash whatever's left over. And um, that's not an option. So what our brand means to people is there's quality. There's um, a commitment by our family and our culture to standing behind that product. Um, it should be easy to install. It should be something that holds up very well. It should be priced fairly. Um, so to me, the brand is absolutely not touchable. It has to stay uh, perceived very, very well or everything else doesn't matter that much. So our brand... We're, uh, I agree with everything Josh just said, we're different in that we are not consumer facing. So we don't have uh, a public profile, so to speak. Uh, we are business to business and probably have 18 to 20 customers total. Um, but we have a brand as well. Uh, we have positioned ourselves as a premium supplier, much like Bacardi. Um, my name is on the building. And one thing I remember my grandfather telling me years ago when I was in school, was that when you put your name on something, you better be proud of it. Don't, you know, ha half ASS it. And that has always stuck with me. And, and through school, if you put your name on the test, you put your name on your homework and then now in work, you put your name as part of this, you know, your company and your name are the same. Um, you better do your best. So uh, from a, a branding standpoint, uh, it's a very personal thing in a family business. Uh, you're not protecting or building someone else's brand. Uh, it's literally your name. So everything that's attached to it is attached to you. So it, it is super, super important. Thank you, Chris. Kevin, last one. So I, I agree. And uh, I think what both Josh and Chris said is spot on. Um, our names are, are not on our buildings. We are 
branded um, differently uh, for our three automotive companies. Uh, with that being said, though, every employee that works here and the majority of our customers that, that do business with us know who the Maher family is and they know that we are the brand and they know uh, the culture and the values that, that we possess. And uh, it's, it's not infrequent that we'll have a, a new hire that will come on board and they'll be, be there for a day and I haven't had the chance to meet them yet for whatever reason. And they'll come up to me and they'll say, oh, Mr. Maher, I just want to introduce myself. I understand you're the owner. I just want to say it's a pleasure to work here and you know, we're, we're going to do good things. And it's, it's fascinating to me because I haven't introduced myself. I, I, if I wasn't inter part of the interview process, they just know that they, they know who our family is. They know what we stand for and they know that it's a good place to be and that we're going to take care of people. So. Awesome. All right. Well, I, I really want to say thank you to the three of you for sharing from your own experience and giving us a little bit of comparing contrast with what we heard from Lizanne and Scott. And uh, Bart, I'm going to turn it back over to you to close us out today. Great. Thank you so much, Gina. And I really want to thank Josh, uh, Chris, and Kevin for a uh, fantastic uh, session. I think it's really interesting for me to think in the first hour, and, and thank you so much to Lizanne and Scott and Spencer for uh, a fantastic first hour, too. Of, I just keep coming back to this uh, family founders and fearless especially the fearless part, I think, in a family business, which is not something I think a lot of people think of. But then you guys really amplified this idea of patient capital and I think patient management. Um, that was a couple things to me that very different from uh, other corporations, non-family businesses. And often having patient capital and patient management allows you to be more fearless, I think, and do kind of more interesting things. And the, and the last thing too, as well as people management that you guys talked a lot about, in particular, managing people as people, not numbers, um, was something I think that really came across to me. And I, I as I said, I really appreciate the insights that uh, you guys had and a uh, great job, uh, Gina, moderating the moderating that session. Thank you all for joining us uh, for our second of four uh, sessions in the our symposium. Uh, next week, we have uh, George H. Walker, the CEO of Newberger Berman. That'll be on Thursday, February 18th. And I look forward to having you all join us then for another great uh, session on family business. So we'll see you hopefully uh, next week. Thank you all very much for joining us. Bye-bye.